Donald Trump did an interview with Israel Hayom. It's an Israeli publication. This is the publication that ha- had been sponsored and funded by the late Sheldon Adelson, who was a Republican mega donor whose primary um, goal was the uh, furthering the settler colonial project in Israel. He was in uh, a, a massive Zionist. So much so that he created this paper and then also donated millions and millions of dollars to Republicans uh, uh, to to support Israel, basically. So Donald Trump sat down with two of these presenters. I mean, um, they're settlers, by the way, at least one of them is a is a infamous right wing settler. Um, Spoke and sat down with them about his position on uh, Israel israel's assault on gaza and let me preface this by saying that if donald trump were president on october 7th and after he would have been the most bloodthirsty guy possible and encouraging them to go after hamas aka palestinians with fire and fury or whatever other language he described it would have been just as despicable um specifically also with the coalitions that come with the Trump administration, including Christian Zionists, zealots, she massive, just regular, you know, uh, uh, religious fundamentalists, basically, um, like Mike Johnson, whatever, Mike Pence, the, those would be the kind of people that he would be surrounded by. Um, and, that and Jared Kushner is who I meant to mention there as well, who wants to develop the beautiful beachfront of Gaza for luxury developments. But with all of that said, Trump still all he has to do to differentiate himself from Biden on this is to be like, well, I would have done it differently. And there's a lot of in, inconsistent thoughts here. But what people should take away from this is that Donald Trump now sees this as a problem and the transcript of this interview by the way which i read through doesn't include some of these responses that trump has they selectively cut out the parts where trump is most critical of israel but these are some of the video clips that included many of the quotes that were not in the transcript of the interview in uh, israel ham countries when i saw october 7th it was one of the saddest things i've ever seen because there was no reason for it they would have never ever done that for two reasons number one they were broke and number two i was the president they would have never done that because they knew there would have been very big consequences all right that being said uh, you have to finish up your war you have to finish it up you got to get it done and uh, i'm sure you'll do that and we got to get to peace. You can't have this going on. Uh, and I will say Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. But you have to finish up. You have to get the job done. And you have to get on to peace. You have to get on to a normal life for Israel and for everybody else. So, so if you re-elect in, in a few months, as one, once again, to visit president, and Israel still may be in a war, how would you help Israel? Well, look, uh, there has been no president better to Israel than me. Iran wanted to make a deal, and with the deal, 90% of the deal that I want to make is no nuclear weapon. That's 90%, almost 100%. All right, so stupid, right? Jesus. Some interesting editing here, too. I wonder, I really wonder what some of the, I mean, there's no oversight of this, obviously. Um, But let's also, let's be clear here again. Uh, Donald Trump ripped up the deal that Obama did that prevented Iran from getting a nuke, in part because Bibi Netanyahu was so aggressively against it. He did some PowerPoint presentation to pressure the Trump administration to withdraw from it by saying, oh, they've actually been lying about this deal and they really have a nuke. There was no evidence to that effect. But Trump did what Netanyahu wanted immediately. Um, He recognized the Golan Heights as well, which he says is uh, 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 worth trillions and trillions of dollars, meaning, you know, it's just another expansionist. uh, Which people don't know, Golan Heights is just like the West Bank occupied uh, uh, illegally. And now we're just going to say like, oh, yeah, you can have that. Right. Um, But this second clip is even more instructive into Donald Trump just as a politician and as a person. So he would have not done 
anything differently in the immediate aftermath of October 7th. He might have been worse in just saying, go to town. He pr- he would have been worse. I mean, um, it might have been like, yeah, Muslim bills and bands and stuff. Bands like and, that, right, yeah. and, and, and just everyone's Hamas, all of that. Um, but he does understand public relations. And listen, he, when you hear him here, he doesn't show any concern about the people of Gaza, but he does show concern about what it looks like. And he says that maybe five or six times. It's October 7, we saw a, a major rise of uh, anti-Semitic uh, attacks in America. What are we going to do about it? Well, that's because you fought back. And when you fought back, uh, and I think Israel made a very big mistake, and I see it, and I saw it every night, and I wanted to call them and say, don't do it. It would say the uh, Israeli defense ministry or a tag would be on these uh, photos and shots, I mean, moving shots of bombs being dropped into buildings in Gaza. And I said, ooh, that's a terrible portrait. It's a bear, you know, it's a very bad picture for the world. The world is seeing yeah, this. Yeah, but, but Hamas terrorists are, are in those buildings, so how can we fight them? You go and do what you have to do. But you don't do that. And I think that's one of the reasons that there has been really, there's been uh, there's been a lot of kickback. If, if people didn't see that, they didn't have to see that. They, every single night I'd watch and every single one of those. And I think Israel wanted to show that it's, you know, tough, but, but sometimes you shouldn't be doing that. Senator. Sometimes you shouldn't be doing that. So he, he has no, humanitarian concern it's actually a, a pretty good indica- example of, of right-wing isolationism as well right they're not going to have the same public relations focused flair that donald trump ex- exudes there um and also his consistent reliance on counterfactuals to say how much better he would do something when of course we have no way to prove that um and most of the evidence would indicate that he would have been worse but he does understand that very notion where the reality is, is he doesn't believe in much except exerting I am number one and looking good. And he's not as ideological about this as Biden. I think that's immensely clear at this point. Biden is a committed Zionist. He speaks emotionally about the need for a Jewish state and his conversations with Golda Meir, among others. He believes in this romantic notion of Israel. Donald Trump doesn't do that. I mean, he cares about it as a maybe potential real estate development, but he's still pissed that Netanyahu recognized Biden as winning the election in 2020. So that motivates him to there to a degree. And when you think back on that, I mean, it's difficult to assess, but we have reports now of Biden undercutting Obama and Hillary Clinton when Hillary was secretary of state under Obama, when they tried to take a tougher line with Benjamin Netanyahu and this government. And then you pair that with all of the, with the historic, uh, love that, that Biden has shown for Israel, the romanticism, as I say, and Netanyahu's immediate recognition, really, of, of um, Biden's victory and not playing into what Trump wanted there, I think it does indicate that Netanyahu understood that he would actually have a pretty good shot to do whatever the hell he wanted under Biden. And he doesn't mind when Trump comes into office because they're both right wingers. The, the right wing coalition in Israel will be like, all right, yeah, we can hurt the hurt the liberals or the Democrats politically by doing what we need to do under this guy who clearly I can manipulate. I think that's Netanyahu's posture. And then when Trump comes into office, it's time to build back better, to borrow a phrase. And that's when we actually solidify our expansion. So we can hurt the, the, the Democrats politically on this to a degree, and I can manipulate him because he was a pretty weak adversary. And I think that was a big part of why Netanyahu was eager to usher in a Biden administration. And then if Trump gets reelected, it's go time to to officialize our settlements. Israel has always been playing this sort of 
uh, game, or at least recently, Operation Cast Lead, they uh, uh, started on December 27, 2008, and wound up right as Obama was inaugurated. They, they uh, absolutely have an eye, uh, one eye on the Palestinians they are murdering, and another eye on American politics. And it is absolutely disgusting. And to feel manipulated by a country uh, like that is, it's it's completely debased. Um, and you have to, at, at a certain point, realize that okay we're actually on board for it um because there's no there's no way we would tolerate other countries treating us like that and uh really like just um putting us to an acid test of how much uh people are will you allow us to kill as we are the world record holder in getting foreign aid from you it's 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 disgusting but i also kind of find an interest kind of what i kind of, i find kind of interesting about the this this clip in relative to everything we've seen with biden handling israeli relations is like the difference is pretty much fundamentally almost just aesthetic like both both biden and trump would ab are absolutely making it pretty clear that they would enable basically anything that israel would want to do in this offensive but the one difference that i think trump sort of gets to your point emma is like a public relations thing is like trump's thing is always about beyond kind of taking credit for all of the strengths or all of like the progress in certain uh capacities it's also about like projecting an air of impunity so i think one difference is he's also just making pretty clear like hey like do it do what you have to do but like make sure you don't get caught like and, and I, that, that's, I would, that's true right make sure no one sees the like, images I, the he, images right bad he's, like, he's like i'm he's like i'm watching this and i'm seeing the optics of it i would much rather you continue a pace at this without anyone actually having a reason to be upset with you yeah i i, I think that that's a fair assessment of of him but at the same time well, why what Trump is doing is more effective here if anyone were to see it is because he's actually commanding to Netanyahu and to Israel, this is what you need to do. Biden's like, you know, I've been trying, I've been, it's the same thing with the immigration thing. I, I don't understand what, you know, he's been a bully in other contexts, Joe Biden, when it comes to say like leftist adv activists that are, were protesting, you know, his immigration policies in the 2020 election and how tough he got on them and was like, vote for Trump then. He knows how to be a bully in certain circumstances, but when it comes to this, he looks weak as hell. I mean, just from a pure, real, like, politique, like, pol political optics perspective, that's where Trump, it's like, he kind of has an instinctive thought about, I, well, I gotta look like the boss here. And Biden is kowtowing to be Benjamin Netanyahu and thinks that the daily leaks about him calling him Netanyahu a doo-doo head to Axios is going to be sufficient to counter that in the public. No one cares. I don't. I also don't. I also think the. I, I'm not saying it to minimize it when I say the aesthetic approach is different because, as you said, as you're saying, Emma too is like Trump understands like brute force and if he, and if he doesn't under in a blunt instrument and like if he's not if he's not intellectualizing it this way i do think he has a fundamental understanding of the fact that like in the geopolitical power dynamic this is a hegemon dealing with a client state yes and biden is what where where that power dynamic is completely subverted to where biden is appearing weak is it's because he's emotional about it. It's because Biden is in the position of being the leader of the hegemon, and the client state is taking advantage of him. Yes, and, because he's romantic about Israel. Right. It's, it's not, sentimentalizing. I mean, Adele said as much. Right. She can't say, right. but it's clearly coming from the top. Right. This is right. Biden. This is Biden's fixation. I was yeah. reading the Evan Osnos profile of Biden in the New Yorker recently, and there was one a quote either from Jeff Zients, the now chief of staff, or just doing people, a horrific or job. people around Biden, where basically they were telegraphing that every negotiation or every deliberation they've had with Israel about the conduct in Israel, they they have basically approached it as if every initial declining of moderating is like a is like a preliminary position yeah that if they continue to negotiate and continue to stay in the room they can get from a no we won't invade Ra no we will not not invade rafa no we won't but we won't stop the bombing we won't stop the uh, blockade of aid that's an initial position so but also but the, what that says to me is like you're you're somehow reverse engineering and backfilling how to not come across as being a mark 
to the to the to these to the, in these negotiations by Instead saying, "Oh, it's a preliminary. It's a preliminary decision." Yeah. They're telling you no. They're saying, "Go kick rocks." They're saying, "Kiss my ass." We're going to keep doing this, and you're saying, "We we have it. We have it in the bag. We just have to move them a little bit." That's it's 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 that is not shrewd negotiating. It's naivete. Yeah, uh, it's cast lead, as people have correctly pointed out. Pull up the uh, thing I just put in sound polls because Joe Biden actually knows how to talk to, and uh, actually, oh, as yeah. people pointed out, like. Apartheid state is actually, that's too kind for Israel. Israel's an exterminationist state. The apartheid was an intervening stage toward that end. Um, but here's Joe Biden uh, in 1986. And let's see if we can uh, uh, look at some of this energy directed towards South Africa. What disturbs me more than the policy that you call a policy is the rationale for the policy. The rationale for the policy. You set out four principles that you, that you adhere to, and then you, and, and I will go over them in a moment. Then you say in page 14, we must not become part of South Africa's problem. We must remain part of their solution. We must not aim to impose ourselves, our solutions, our favorites in South Africa. Damn it, we have favorites in South Africa. The favorites in South Africa are the people who are being repressed by that ugly white regime. We have favorites. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black, and they are being excoriated. It is not to some stupid puppet government over there. It is not to the Afrikaners regime. We have no loyalty to them. We have no loyalty to South Africa, to South Africans. And the fact of the matter is we, I mean, I listen to this rationale, first of all. It is the leaders of South Africa and their people, black and white, who have the majority responsibility. They must rise to it. Well, they are rising to it. They're rising to it. The only thing left available to them with that repulsive, repugnant regime of Afrikaners there. And it's the only way they have. They've tried everything for the last 20 years. They begged, they borrowed, they crawled. And now they're taking up arms. The second thing, progress Woo. peace requires a timetable. Timetable, elimination of a part. What's our timetable? What are we saying to that repugnant regime? Are we saying you've got 20 days, 20 months, 20 years? We ask them to put up a timetable. What's our timetable? These people are being crushed. And we're sitting here with the same kind of rhetoric. The same thing we heard. We heard go slow. We heard we have to take care of the problem afterwards. We heard we you can't have, impose. You, you are totally misconstruing the testimony my... that I gave. Read first. Furthermore, Senator, let me say that I hate to hear a senator of the United States calling for violence. I'm not calling That's for violence. That's what you're doing. I hate that is to exactly hear exactly what you're doing. Hamas hate supporter. To hear and the Secretary of State refusing to act on a morally abhorrent point. I hate to hear this country, I'm ashamed that this country puts out a policy like this that says nothing, nothing. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, he's literally saying that, yeah, there's gonna be violence. Violence happens when you don't address this stuff. But, I mean, and uh, look, the, and this is not to, to welcome to, it to, to water down the atrocities of the apartheid regime in south africa i mean no it was biden's outrage was justified of course if not if it wasn't if it wasn't actually sincere it, well it's a but, great performance though. i mean it was great and of course like there were political it, it had crossed a certain threshold by that point in 1986 where he had been it was politically advantageous of him to make this determination but like but actually it should be politically advantageous to make the same determination about israel now it but should I mean, be, and, but and I, he, he views it in the terms it, of the holocaust which is insane and, and i'm sorry but i'm sorry also like like truly like this is i i've watched this clip many times because it showed kind of like joe biden's skill as an order and a politician um and honestly because he looks so much like hunter biden in that, in that clip but but yeah um sometimes i think about it where it's like you take those words and put it them in rashida talib or, or nora Arakat or someone like that you put those words in, in those those people's mouths they're talking about this circumstance they would be talking about this circumstance right now and any number of people who are very supportive of joe biden would would un, unequivocally be calling them a terrorist oh yeah like oh, yeah. Like, at, like that was he, just justifying hamas terrorism justifying yeah. hamas terrorism like, yeah. george schultz is george schultz that the reagan secretary of state in that in that committee hearing is responding the way that people are responding to demonstrators now being like i would never suppose that a elected member of this body would would condone violence it's like that's the person who was on the wrong side of this conflict and that's what joe biden that's where joe biden is now right 
Exactly. Somehow, 40 years later, mm-hmm. as the president, as opposed to being in that committee room. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you know, people point out Biden was a Zionist and a supporter of Israel throughout that this entire time. And that that is a contradiction uh, there. But I was also pointing out, you know, we, we talk about the romanticism. I saw Bernie talking about Golda Meir uh, and talk about how this is no longer the embedded. Israel of Golda Meir. And it's like that you feel like first of all like if he, he must believe that because otherwise he would feel embarrassed to say such a ridiculous thing uh, out loud when people know who Golda Meir is now a uh, racist uh, supportive ethnic cleansing yeah like I mean and you know Bernie's the, literally the, probably the best senator on this issue absolutely I mean <laughs> and, you know that's the, although that's I don't know if Chris, I don't know from. if Chris Van Hollen would, would harken back Van Hollen back. voted for the unrest stuff that's Van true. Hollen gets nothing that's true that's true yeah I mean Golda Meir said this which uh, by the way was I, I heard, you know, uh, people were sending this quote around um, in uh, in the wake of October 7th. Uh, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. We cannot forgive them for forcing us to kill their children. We will only have peace with the Arabs when they love their children more than they hate us. So she saw, I believe, food on the tables of expelled Palestinians like she she was there. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not forty-eight. But some. Maybe, I, I'll look up that reference. But like, did she get her house when the Palestinians that she stole them from were at a religious service or when they were at a wedding? It's hard to determine. Um, anyway, uh, fizzy drink says that was two lobotomies and three facelifts ago. <laughs> okay.